I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. Some of you have listened to the podcast and decided to make a career change. In many cases, that has meant becoming an entrepreneur. Our guest today is a serial entrepreneur, and in fact, he was just on the Shark Tank premiere. He pitched his new company, Unchartered Supply. In this episode, Christian Schaff and I dissect the experience on Shark Tank, the steps he took to get on the show, his strategy for making it in front of the sharks, what it was like to be standing behind those intimidating double doors before you walk into the tank, and what the process was really like behind the scenes. Christian also talks about the colorful career journey that he's had and how most of his Why Not Now moments have meant deciding to leave or stop something in order to make space to start something new. Christian has been to Iraq 40 times, bringing music and entertainment to the troops. He started a cider company, a survival products company, and he's toured as a musician, among other things. He just might be the world's most interesting man. Before we get started, let me fill you in on something that's been a lifesaver. It's called Design Pickle. Get it? You're in a pickle because you need a design, ASAP, but you don't have the time or maybe even the skill to do it yourself. With Design Pickle, you pay a flat rate monthly fee of $370 and you're given a dedicated designer for all of your needs. And the first 14 days are risk-free. You get a full refund if you cancel in the first two weeks. For me, the process has been painless and ego-free. In fact, the Why Not Now posts you're seeing on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and everywhere else were created from my buddies at Design Pickle. I found I was spending so much time resizing images and trying to design things on my own. I didn't have the budget to hire a design firm or an agency, yet it was becoming too expensive for me to budget my own time. I'm now on a first name basis with my designer. She's learned my style and we're in a groove. Why not now listeners get 30% off their first month? You can go to designpickle.com forward slash why not now to redeem the offer. It's a great solution for entrepreneurs. A mentor once said to me, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Do what you're uniquely qualified to do. Design Pickle helps me do just that. Welcome to the show, Christian. How are you doing? Thank you. Doing well. Doing well out here in uh, beautiful Park City, Utah and another beautiful brisk day out here. Good, good deal. Yeah, big break from LA where you used to live. So maybe we'll get to that in the show. But I, <laughs> so, I like that uh, that progress of, of your location. Interview. Yes, yes. Let's hop right in. Okay. Tell me about a time when you had to ask yourself, why not now? Yeah. So I had a feeling you'd ask me this. Listen <laughs> to your podcast. Um, you know, I've I've never had a problem jumping into things. I think it's just probably my personality. But the way I was raised was really like to keep your commitments and stick with things. And so when you when I thought about that question, why not now? The thing that kept resonating with me is like knowing the right time to quit something or to leave something or to let it go. Um, and I don't know if there are other people out there like me, but 
I have I have a much easier time saying yes to something than saying sorry. I, I'm going a different direction. So, man, <laughs> this sounds funny, but there are two experiences that come to mind um, when I talk about that. The first one was after high school. I was a musician most of my life, and I was a really good saxophone player. And I went to the University of Wisconsin. I was signed up to go to school, and for whatever reason, a bunch of people around my family had friends that were had something to do with the marching band at Wisconsin. If anybody knows Wisconsin, the marching band is kind of a big deal and they're nationally known. And everybody said, you have to do the marching band. And I, you know, being young, I was like, okay. And, um, I I think it was three or four days into practice, maybe two hours into practice. The first practice I was like, this is not for me, but so many people kept calling saying, well, how's marching band? And I thought I can't let them down. And it took me three or four days to finally just tell them I'm not, going to do this. And while that sounds really small, that is like maybe the first time in my life I remember. And it's probably because I was out of the house. I was making my own decisions. It was the first time where I felt a lot of people saying you should be doing this. And I just decided by myself for my good, this is not what I want to do. And, you know, I think it was the right decision, nothing against the marching band, obviously, but there was a lot of other great things I did in college that led me to where I am today that I probably wouldn't have done if I had invested so much time over there. Mm. That's probably the the safest answer. <laughs> the other ones usually come around uh, relationships and and even jobs. You know, being at a job and you hire people and me personally, I feel a commitment. If I bring somebody on to be a part of my team or I've done that in the past, I feel like I'm their leader and I can't I can't leave the war. And so it's always been a very hard thing for me to know when the right time is to walk away when you feel like people are counting on you and part of a team. This is good. I like, I like your answer. It's unique and it's, you can't have one without the other usually in order to have a why not now. A lot of the times you have to make space. And so you have to be giving something up in terms of opportunity cost and how you were raised, it really resonates with me. And I'm kind of thinking about maybe the Catholic guilt that I carry sometimes of, (laughs) you know, not feeling guilty. You can't leave something or oftentimes the team, um, the people around you. And yet your history and, and track record, Christian, is so colorful and diverse. And I mean, from live events and performing in Iraq to starting a beer company, starting a, a new apparel company and fitness and everything in between. A musician, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, you're like an adventure expert too. So you, in order to have had to have done a lot of these things, you, you've had to become probably pretty good at saying, why not now pause or stop this and start X, Y, Z. So how do you do that? Do you is it a, a process or have you built a formula? Because you have had so many cool, diverse paths. It's a great question. And thanks for calling it colorful. Cause sometimes I wonder if I'm just scattered and all over the place, but oh no, and well, I want to get touched back on this. Cause I actually <laughs> think it's such a, a cool example of something. So but, it's been a weird journey and, and as scattered as things look, um, they all led to one another. You know, one of my favorite quotes is life is not a dress rehearsal. And I think when I go to bed at night, I want to make sure like I didn't waste that day because you're not going to get it back. And I think that's why I'm so inclined to try things and say yes to things. And I think everything kind of has a beginning. So let's say I'm going to start a company. Well, day one doesn't take 100% of your attention. It may take a couple hours while you're jogging, thinking about what the company name would be and what the products would be and who your audience would be. And I think for me, it's it's like scales, right? Like I, I, I had a, a mentor that always told me, well, you, you can't be half pregnant. You have to be in or out on something. And I agree with that partially because I think you get to a point where you have to, to be successful at something, you really have to give it a lot of attention. But before that, there's a long lead up time where you can feel things out and say, like the marching band, is this right for me? Is it not? And if it's not, then you can, you can move to something else. I've, for all the things you just listed in my life, There's probably 25 other things that I put weeks or months or parts of a year into that that didn't work out. So I I don't know. I think for me, it's really it's been a lot of um, self-reflection and understanding 
maybe my personality and where my skills are and knowing how long something can keep my attention and what things I am good at. You know, I'm not, I'm an idea guy more than I'm a, a detail guy. So I gravitate one way or the other based on that. And I think that's helped kind of shape where I am today. What I love about your, um, I'm going to call it changing swim lanes, and, and it sounds very fluid, and you're exactly right. Things don't just stop and start, and it's, it's almost like you date an idea, and the idea gets more serious, and then you're exclusively dating the idea, and then maybe you oh, actually commit and get your business license and spend some money against it, and that's like your agreement, your formal that's a maybe great analogy. contract, yeah. right? But, and, and I totally hear you. It's... It's a fluid building, brewing thing. Um, looking at your your LinkedIn profile, or your resume per se, something that really struck me in kind of reviewing your past and, and these different experiences you've had is that oftentimes I've heard in my own career growing up, people would say, Amy, stay in your swim lane. And I remember it so vividly, someone specifically saying this to me that I, I really respected when I was starting to venture into a different one <laughs> or wanting to, which was like every other day. And, um, and I'm so glad that I didn't maybe take that too, too seriously because I, I didn't want to stay in my swim lane. You know, I, it, it, one thing of course does lead to another, but we don't have to anymore. You know, we don't have to go get the degree, get the internship that matches the degree, put the ladder against the wall and climb, climb, climb. Because oftentimes, I think sometimes we find we're climbing up the wrong ladder or against the wrong wall. And it's cool because you've been able to exercise different talents. And has that been intentional? Um, you know, when people, people always, you know, it is, you get in an elevator with somebody and they go, well, what do you do? And it's like, uh, <laughs> same. Like, yeah, Sometimes like, yeah, I make I things I'm, up. <laughs> right, right. I'm an astronaut. Um, if you tell them like the one thing you're doing now, that's like, um, that's not even one piece of the puzzle, you know? So uh, I've thought about this too. And I think for me, it's drilling down to what I know I've been able to do well in different platforms or different types of careers. And for me, this may sound a little bit silly, but it almost kind of came back to storytelling. So when you're launching a company, you have to sell people on, on the vision and the story. If, you know, if, we're, if I was a musician and we're writing albums, um, each song is a story and the album is a bigger story. And when I was doing promotional events for Harley Davidson or you know, I've done work for companies like GoPro, it's all about crafting content and good content has a story in the base of it. So one of the things I always kind of go back to is I, I've found that I've been able to look at things and kind of get to the essence of, well, here's, here's a thread that I think people will understand and kind of enjoy either exploring or becoming a part of. And that's, I think, what's guided me kind of down these paths a lot. But if you look at it from 10,000 feet, it looks like I just shotgunned things up on a wall and they're all super different. When actually, I mean, if we think about it, innovation is often putting two things together or multiple things together that haven't collided or converged before. And so that's really what you've, what you've been doing. So are you, you're familiar with the term you know, zone of genius versus zone of excellence? I'm not. Okay. So I just read a couple months ago a book about this. And then I have a friend who sometimes comes on the podcast. Her name is Susie Batiste, who has, has taught me a little bit more about this. And, um, and so I, I might botch this, but let me give it a shot. A zone of, of excellence is what you do well. You just know you're good at it. And you know, everyone tells you that you're good at it. And people want you to do that thing because you do it really well. You're really excellent at it. And then your zone of genius is this thing that you have that nobody else has. And this area of talent that's uh, that's so unique that it's really above and beyond and it transcends the zone of excellence. So what would you say your zone of genius is? <laughs> and most people don't ever really exercise their zone of genius because it's it, it pushes you to actually identify it. But you get happy and and 
content with your zone of excellence, right? So hopefully I bought you a little bit more time to think about that. <laughs> wow. I, I may regret this answer later because I'm just shooting from the hip. Um, taking a swing at this, I, I don't know if I'd consider myself a genius in anything. I mean, I'd, I, I appreciate even thinking about the idea that I'm that good at something. But I, I think, like you said, it's, it's like connecting dots that other people don't see. I think I've had some success with that in the past. Even with my company now, I think over the years going from working uh, in that agency to helping start a, a hard apple cider company to doing tour, you know, all these things, I was always kind of uh, finding market space, I guess. Um, uh, this mentor, Joe Heron, he's, he was a guy that started Crispin Cider um, with me. He had all these great one-liners. And the other one was, he's always like Christian market space, not marketplace. And that is like a lens I put everything through for the last 15 years. And what that means to me is, um, let's say, you know, Red Bull came onto the market all of a sudden, and then there's all these competitors. It's like, why would you, why would you try to go to a crowded marketplace? Like what's the derivative from that where there's an open swim lane to go back to your swim lane, uh, analogy. I mean, I, I have spent the last 10 or 12 years with my brother, not only sending our band, but hundreds of other entertainment tours to Iraq to play for the troops. So in a time when it's hard for bands to get gigs and it's hard to get crowds and it's hard to find, you know, even a way to cover your costs, we opened up this huge opportunity where we could, we could find the right bands, send them over. They get in front of an amazing audience. That audience is super loyal, um, supports them when they come back over. You're doing a great service for them. And it, it's just a win, win, win. But while entertainment had been going on for the troops for years, my brother and I did it in a way that nobody had done before, which allowed us to build this huge kind of platform there. I think it's the same thing that we're doing now with Uncharted Supply. I, I, I could probably get into this later, but what I really found was, wow, there's like a million outdoor companies, but nobody's really talking about personal preparedness. There was just a huge market space there where there's already a Patagonia and a North Face and, and you know, Arcteryx and Oakley. And people are people love making cool Gore-Tex jackets and ski goggles and whatever. But those are giants you have to battle. But if you look just to the right a couple degrees, survival is not that far off. You know, you're still talking about a lot of the same gear and the same kind of experiences. And there's literally nobody. And mm -hmm. so that's, I think, where I've been probably more successful than in other areas is, is finding those gaps and trying to figure out how to optimize them. See, there you go. You just identified your, your zone of genius. <laughs> uh, having kind of watched and, and listening to you, that, that makes sense. It's a very unique um, aspect of who you are and what you do. But this market space versus marketplace, I, I love that. And it's finding the open market spaces and, and not necessarily the crowded categories, but I think it was Matt Mullenweg once said, um, if he sees a really busy kind of area category or, or uh, wave building, he usually looks away and there's something there when you look away kind of, and it's, it's very wise. Um, let's hop into uncharted supply because you, you mentioned it and I want to get to this for sure. Not only because it's a very innovative, very cool company, but also you were just on Shark Tank like this last week for the season premiere, which is huge. Yeah. Um, so tell us about the company and then let's roll into your experience a little bit and, and let's dig around what that Shark Tank process was like. But uncharted supply survival gear, right? So you are. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'll dive right into it. So, um, <laughs> I've been to Iraq 40 times. I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin where I had a dad who, a dad and a mom, I should say, who were the hardest working people I know. And they expected the same out of you, whether it was, you know, 40 below zero or 110 degrees, um, maybe a bit personal, but I mean, I, I had hernia surgery at 11 because I threw hay bales all summer that weighed more than I did at the time. Oh. I mean, that's, that's how I grew up. So very outdoorsy, um, going to be in the tractor all day. You better bring warm clothes because you're out there and we're not, 
I mean, don't get me wrong, my parents would bring me stuff, but they definitely encouraged me to plan ahead and let me make mistakes so it wouldn't happen again. So all that, um, you know, I've got into the Ironman scene a little bit, doing triathlons, I backcountry ski, I go elk hunting. I, I just, I love the outdoors and I've always kind of lived in the outdoors. And then I took a job in Orange County, California a few years ago. And I remember, I just, I remember everything about that day. Even though I was in this job, I'm always thinking about what's next and, you know, what would be a good product idea. And um, <clears throat> that's always kind of percolating. And I was driving between meetings and there was a tight window and I had a couple of people that worked for me with me and it started sprinkling. And I mean, you know, we all have automatic wipers on our windshields. It wasn't even turning those on. I mean, it was more like a fog or a mist than a rain and traffic just stopped. And I had been in Orange County a few months and I remember looking at my friend Jacqueline and I said, is there a wreck? Can you look on Google? And she's like, no, it's because it's raining out. And I said, this isn't rain. Like, what do you mean? She's like, oh, that's right. You're not from here. She's like, people don't know how to handle anything, but you know, 75 and sunny. And I'm like, <laughs> whatever. And she's like, no, I'm serious. Just, just watch. And she was totally right. Um, I had that experience over and over and over. And the, the, the straw that kind of broke the camel's back was I was driving to Steamboat Springs for New Year's, uh, you know, one winter and, and there's some mountains behind Orange County and it snowed like two inches and it was like slushy snow, but it added eight hours to my drive. It just stopped everybody. And I had an F-150 full of ski gear. I was fine. But the thing was, is I was stuck in the middle of a hundred thousand people and it didn't matter if I was fine, if nobody else was fine. And it really got me down this path of what happens if something really serious happens? Like what happens if the San Andreas fault finally goes and the big one hits. Or, I mean, I, I hate talking about this stuff. I, I'm not like a, a super doomsday guy, but it's, it's fair to acknowledge the fact that terrorism is on the rise and climate change is happening. And areas of our country are getting highly, highly populated, if not overpopulated. And everybody just keeps turning a blind eye. And as long as their Uber shows up, everything's cool. And so I got down this path of well, who's servicing this, this need and why aren't people responding to it? And what I found was everybody I talked to said, oh yeah, I, I, need, I need supplies. I don't know how to do anything. I'm totally unprepared. But nobody could name a brand. Nobody could tell me the first step. And that's where I, I realized there was an opportunity and that just kind of sent me down the wormhole I'm in right now. And that's designing these products. Should I keep going here, or You're, is this good? Or? No, this is this is good. Okay. You've definitely given us a lay of the land, and yeah. and by the way, these products not only um, are they life saving, literally, but their peace of mind. Uh, I imagine is just you know having some of these products in the back of your trunk for, for moms, I can imagine just is a, a peace of mind kind of ticket. But um, Mother Nature is kind of your marketing campaign right now. I know that's that's it's, not I a good plan, thing, but man, I, I these hurricanes. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't plan it and I, I would prefer that these things weren't happening, but right. it's hard to deny it hasn't been good for business. Um, you know, you talk about peace of mind. I think I think historically what I found was, you know, everybody knows the term prepper and they usually envision a guy in a gas mask that has a bunker, probably like uh, uh, John Goodman's character in is a 10 Cloverfield Lane where he's got that shelter and he's weirded out about everything. But the reality is there's, there's like 50, 70 million car wrecks a year and people break their arm all the time and people get dehydrated. And it's not just the big things, but it's, it's the little things and it, it doesn't take much to turn a potentially deadly situation into just kind of an inconvenience if you're prepared. And that's kind of the position we've taken, which is, which is very different than, than anybody out there trying to compete in this space. And that's like, Hey, you know, life happens and our kits will, you know, I just did a huge uh, blog post on what actually happens if a nuclear bomb drops. And the reality is the product we've designed if you can get into a building, I mean, the the bottom line is a bomb hits, you want to get into a big brick building and you wait for like three or four days and the half-life of radioactive material gets down to a point in three or four days where you can actually come back out and you should, you know, have some clothes on and air mask and goggles. But those are all the things we provide in addition to enough food for three or four days and water 
and a way to communicate and a way to charge batteries. So we designed something that could go all the way to the worst case scenario, all the way down to, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was hiking with a friend and they forgot sunscreen. And I was like, oh, I have sunscreen in my kit. Like, here we go. So really small things to, to really big things. That's what we've tried to kind of cover for people. And it's, it's not really rocket science. It's just kind of planning ahead. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more from Christian. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery. Yep, the original before you go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you know what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit poopery.com and why not now listeners get 20% off with code why not now. That's all one word. So fast forward Tell us about Shark Tank. How did this happen? What was it like? We want to know all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, I think, I think people probably see those long lines in, in all the cities across the country where you go in, you get in front of people. I was lucky enough to avoid that. Um, one of my business partners, his name is Mike Escamilla. Uh, his nickname is Rooftop. He's a, a pretty famous BMX rider, stuntman, TV host, and he has an agent. And the agent, um, you know, we were like, Hey, I think we're at a place where we should get on shark tank. And I, I was fully prepared to go get in line. And I still believe if I would have been in one of those lines, we would have made it through, but I got to give Mike and his agent some love here because they at least got us on the, on the phone with the casting director. Um, this was last January, but that call was about five minutes. She said, okay, guys, tell me what you're doing. And we told her and she said, cool, well, send me a video. Here's my email address. Talk to you later. So it wasn't like we really jumped to the front of the line. We basically got the okay to, um, to submit and to make sure that it would get across her desk. So that was the first step for us. And I know that's maybe a, a little bit of an advantage, but. Tell, real quick about the video. Let's, let's not skip any details. What was in the video? Was this, was she wanting to see your, your dynamic together? Was she just wanting to see more product? And you, what, it, how, what'd she do? Yeah, basically, as you get through these first auditions and they go, okay, submit a video and we'll, we'll take it up another level. And they tell, I can't remember the exact specifications, but it's like, send us a two or three minute video explaining your product and who you are and why you think you should be on the show. You know, it's just kind of a casting mm-hmm. tape type thing. Um, I've, now, we're not technically supposed to share these anywhere. We have, we have not shared ours. I wish we could, um, but Shark Tank doesn't doesn't mm-hmm. want us to put those out. I've seen some that people have put out no matter what. And, you know, some people just point their iPhone at themselves and talk for a couple of minutes. We went, we went full out, um, smoke bombs, uh, fires, jumping off 40 foot cliffs into rivers. Um, a lot of humor. We tried to make it like we were making a TV show. And I, I, I truly, and I got to give Mike a lot of credit for that. He's had so much experience in TV. He's like, we got to make this entertaining. He, and he kept saying from right on, right at the beginning, he's like, you have to remember this is a TV show mm-hmm. and it has to be entertaining. Mm-hmm. So that's what I was getting at. I thought maybe there was something more than flipping the iPhone around and <laughs> with you. And that's, that's wise. I mean, for anyone listening, you have to put that into it in order to even get to the next step, right? I think they told us 60,000 or 70,000 businesses applied this season. So if you just put yourself in the casting director's shoes, that's a lot to sort through. And what are you going to do to stand out? I mean, this is, this is great uh, practice for even just any business, right? It's like there's always competition, and how do you get above it? And sometimes it just takes more work than the bare minimum of what they're asking for. And I think if I have to point at one thing, I think that video did a lot for us. Um, they told us it was the best one they've ever received. They, they text us all the time like saying, oh, we watched your video again just because it was hilarious. And, um, and that was good. So, uh, so you get in or you're on the next, at least you make it to the next step. Yeah. And I don't remember how many steps there were. I bet <laughs> there were five or six and we'd have a call like every month, you know, we get an email and we talk to them and then we'll get back to you and congrats. You made it through the next step and okay, now film another video, like what your pitch would be. And 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 there was I don't know maybe a hundred pages of papers we had to fill out. I mean this is not uh, they don't they don't take too many risks with this. They really want to know that these businesses are 
are real and functioning and you're not a criminal in some far off land. I mean, they do a lot of digging behind you. And to make a long story short, by by May, they said, okay, um, start blocking some time off to come out to LA. We're going to we're going to take you to the next round. And even flying to LA, they're like, we can't even guarantee you're going to get in front of the sharks. You still have to pitch in front of our producers. And even if you get past the producers, we always have more people just in case um, something happens. So literally we didn't know we were pitching to the sharks until we were standing in front of those big double doors that open <laughs> and we walked down the hall. I mean, oh, we're sitting in our I can hear the music. <laughs> oh yeah. And they're, like, they're like, okay, you're going to go in like two hours. And then it'd be like, uh, these people are taking a longer. It might be four hours. And then it's like, oh, they're at lunch now. We don't know if we're going to get to you today. And if we don't get to you today, we'll probably send you home and have you come back in November. <laughs> and, you know, we sit there and go, are they doing this just to kind of get us riled up? Or is this, is it really this flexible? But honestly, we didn't, we didn't know if we were filming until, until we were walking down that hall. And that, that's a rush in itself. Okay, so you're there behind the double doors. Yeah. You're walking out. Sharks are staring at you. Well, yeah, here's... An, I may be overstepping my bounds a bit, but I'll, I, hopefully they don't get mad about this. But the doors open, you walk in, and you have to stand there for two minutes and not say a word because uh, they've got to get a bunch of camera angles mm -hmm. and get the lighting right. So mm -hmm. it's not like you walk in, it's like you can break the ice and say hi. You walk in and you stand there. And as a guy who's watched nine, eight seasons of this, that was, you know, you just kind of you smile at Cuban, you, who you've talked to, right? You smile at mm -hmm. Barbara, you smile at Laura, you just kind of, Go down the list and hope your zipper's up and um, try to remember <laughs> what you're supposed to say in a minute. Wow. So that two-minute little pause is, it's like... Like four hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this total stare down. Um, so then uh, you're, you get started... And I, we've had a couple of sharks on the show. I mean, Mark Cuban, obviously, and then Chris Saka, who was was kind of a guest shark last season, or maybe it was the season before. Um, and were they as tough as they seem? And and we have to remember as viewers, there's so much that's probably cut. So that edit is what determines everything. Um, but is the intimidation what you would think and what you feel when you're watching it? I would say yes and no. So, you know, we do our pitch that everybody does at the beginning and they listen. And then I remember, you know, we kind of had to reorganize a little bit. If you've watched the episode, you can see that um, we have this wall where we simulate an earthquake and then we had to move that out of the way and then reveal our product. And I remember as we were revealing the product, you know, we were kind of setting up and the producer said, don't worry about this. We'll cut around this. Just get set up. But, so I kind of had my back to the camera, and I was just focused on that. And I just remember the, the sharks was saying, oh, cool. Oh, this is neat, you guys. Like, oh, I like the logo. And right there, that was a very, like, a very calming moment for me because I was like, oh, these guys are going to be human with us. So I was like, well, that's great. They're, they're actually going to be conversational, and it's not going to be super rigid. That said, I walked over there. I get back to my mark. We start filming again. And literally four out of the five sharks ask me a question all at the same time, and they demand your attention right now. So it's like, oh, okay, this is this is real once again. I mean, when you're ask when you're answering a uh, a question for Mark Cuban about cost per acquisition, and then Robert Herzog goes, were, "Were you in the military, Christian?" And Lori's going, "I have a question. You're going to want to hear me." It's really hard to know who to give your attention to and how to answer the question as quickly as possible and get to the next person. Because in the back of your head, you're still thinking, there's 20 cameras recording everything. And you don't want to have that like one look with your mouth hanging open that they use for a pregnant pause in the edit. You know, So um, <laughs> it's, it is intimidating. It's, it's a blend. It's, just, it's very different than you probably think. So, and, and hopefully, a lot of the listeners right now have just watched the episode. So they will be able to kind of bridge what you're saying now and adding the, the backstory and play by play with what they saw. Um, yeah. For those who maybe haven't seen it yet and they need to catch up, what can you tell us? And maybe we want to leave it as a surprise, but uh, what's the net net? Here's, here's some other color around Shark Tank that I. I did some research on that I thought was really interesting. Going back to that whole, this is a TV show thing, a lot of what you see on TV is people arguing about valuations. And, and you know, we were in the tank for an hour. We've heard that people have been up there in there for two and a half hours. And this gets edited down to, what, wow. seven, eight, ten minutes. Um, so 
we thought it was really important to make sure the conversation was about the product and was fun and exciting and was positive. Because of that, we put our value of our company way lower than we knew we could get money at outside of Shark Tank. And we did that because we didn't want people saying, well, let's talk about your value, how are you justifying that? We wanted people saying, this is really cool and I like it and get them kind of arguing with each other, fighting over a piece of it because it was such a good deal. We felt like that was going to make better TV, and I think the end result shows that it did. I mean, we made the season premiere out of you know yeah. 60,000 some applicants. So that is just a really interesting point. If there's somebody out there that's thinking about doing this, I, I can't urge you enough to consider what the real goal is, and that's getting on TV because that exposure is priceless. Um, I, think I, I think I went on a tangent there, but... Um, it was an intense, intense hour. Okay, yeah, and it's um, that's really interesting strategy. And and even though you might be giving more of your baby away or feeling like you're not getting what it's worth, that upside with TV exposure may just exponentially <laughs> exceed that valuation. Right. And that's something I've actually talked to Mark Cuban about before. Was those casting directors have to go through such due diligence because it, it sounds like what's happening is so many entrepreneurs are wanting to get on the show just for the exposure and they, do, they don't even want to do a deal. And it really pisses the sharks off, right? And, right, and, and the whole totally. production crew. And of course, it's a waste of time, but it's it's become such a spotlight that they have to, I imagine, do such a rigorous filter filtering process of who even gets on because you are given a lot of exposure and and you have yet to see what that what that is because it's just now happening but there I'm sure there's some calculation or quotient for that you know it's like the old Oprah effect <laughs> exactly and that's why we didn't want to go in and offer 30 percent of our business you know we thought hey if we offered five percent of our business we can gamble with 5% for an opportunity like this and see what happens. And who wouldn't want somebody like Robert Herzevec or Mark Cuban in their corner to offer some advice? I mean, when you look at it, it's like we almost just looked at it like a write-off to get the exposure and to have these contacts and to have this advice. We thought that would be um, reasonable mm -hmm. for what we thought we would get for our 5%. And you know, I, I, I still think it is. The Shark Tank effect is a, a real thing. You can Google online and you can just see all day long companies that went from, you know, nice sales to crazy sales yeah. overnight. Absolutely. So it's really, it's really a platform. So did you get a deal? Inquiring minds want to know. Yeah. So we did. Um, you know, Robert, Robert offered us um, kind of double what we were asking for, not double the valuation, but we were asking for $100,000 for 5% of the company. And he ended up giving us in, on the show $200,000 for 10% of the company. Now, I get it. Most of those guys want to do a bigger deal so they have a bigger upside. Um, I think he framed that nicely. I think he told us, hey, I think you guys need more money and I, I really want to help you. My gut is Robert's like, I want to own more of this and, and take, you know, take as much Make as I can. Make it worth my while, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, you know, um, people always ask, did you have somebody in mind when you went into the tank? And I, I really didn't. You know, if, if, if we were a strict apparel business, you know, there's a, there's a guy for that. If, if you're in tech, there's a guy for that. If you want to get in QVC, there's a girl for that. <laughs> but survival, I've watched every show. I couldn't figure out who the right one was. So our gut was... Let's go with whoever gets the most excited and sees our vision, you know, quickly and wants to get involved. And Robert right away just seemed excited about it. I mean, he races Ferraris. Mm -hmm. He's he the adventure guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, okay, this is a good fit. And if you watch, uh, you know, Lori was about to make us an offer too. And man, it is, it is hard to make decisions that quickly. I, I, maybe I should have countered more with Robert. Maybe I should have heard Lori out. But kind of a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush, right? And Robert was kind of there and giving me a, a ticking time clock on what I had to do. And when I looked at our brand and, and who is closer to our brand, is it Lori or is it Robert? I just felt like Robert was, was the choice and, and we went with it. So it was, it kind of reminds me of uh, that part in old school when, when Will Ferrell blacks out and doesn't remember like giving that great answer at the, 
it's a debate, <laughs> you know, like you're up there and everything's happening so fast and you walk out and it's like, what just happened? I imagine. And you, and you're given no footage, no, no photos. And so you've just been kind of in the dark until, till recently. Right. So that's, that's another thing. It's like, did it happen that way? Did I say that? What, um, very, very cool. That's congratulations. Um, and, and being in the premiere episode is, is a huge hat tip in itself. Uh, right. and yeah. And, and recently someone said to me on, I think it was Twitter. I was talking about something Mark Cuban has said on this show when he came on the why not now podcast. And, and he talks about how being nice is a huge asset, especially right now in negotiating. And someone yeah. said, well, I've never heard Mark Cuban, uh, described as nice. And, uh, I actually have had a different experience. I mean, he is tough, but he's he's always been nice, kind to me. And uh, from what I've experienced, what was your experience? Well, you know, my experience was with Mark was really just from when we walked in the doors to when we walked out. But I've, you know, anecdotally, I've heard stories from you and from other people. And, and our experience there, like what I would say, um, and I don't know him that well, is tough is a great word. I think... I think he has a really high uh, bullshit meter. Mm -hmm. And if you're honest with him and you're working hard, he'll give you a lot. But the minute he starts thinking you're, you're taking advantage of something or maybe being misleading, I think he cuts people out pretty quick. And I, that's really in line with a lot of people I know that are that, that busy or that high profile. Mm -hmm. um, people like that, sometimes they, they you know, get the, the reputation of being a little cutthroat and I, I get it because man, I know how busy I am and I'm like a hundred miles, you know, below yeah. the level of anxiety and, and craziness that's going on every day for these people. And they just, I think they get really good at maximizing their time and investing where it makes sense. So I, I would have loved to work with Mark. Um, Mark, you know, Mark told us, and man, I don't know, I would love to have another chance to talk to Mark and see what he really thought. But, you know, he went out on the deal and he told us, basically told us as he thought we were doing a good enough job that he didn't know where he would add value. And I would have loved to argue that case with him for a while. But when things are happening fast, you just kind of say, okay, shoot, thank Got you. A few but others that you to have me, to that was like, do. Yeah, but if he's going to go out and he's saying, you guys are doing such a good job, I don't know how I could how I can really help. Um, that's about the best compliment you yeah. can get somebody not investing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So changing gears here, why not now this, this concept, you have a lot going on right now, clearly. Um, but is there something you've been thinking about doing that now is the time to ask yourself that question? Why not now? Could be personal. could be professional. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, I mean, I think you've tried to set me up a couple times. Uh, I think it'd be really <laughs> fun to have a, have a to get into a relationship of some sort at some point. But maybe know, that's a uh, new website of Shark Tank. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have said no to the Bachelor before. I refuse to do that. But um, that's something that's definitely high on my priority list personally. I just I, I think I've had an amazing life. I, it'd be fun to be able to experience that with somebody and and find somebody that wants to have this crazy of a life with me. So that, that's something, you well, know, let's, professionally or outside of that. Whoa, 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 let's not brush over that real quick because that's actually the first that's time I've... It, <laughs> no, no, let's keep going, let's keep going. Um, no. You're like, oh gosh. Let's, let's talk about that because it's probably on the minds of a lot of people out there. It's actually never come up before on the show and I appreciate your bravery and, and willingness to to be vulnerable and even mentioning that, um, or promotional, who knows? <laughs> um, but how do you tackle that? Why not now you, you've tackled quite a few in your life. What this is, this is unique situation. So where do we start? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that's my million dollar question. I, um, listen, you, I've, <laughs> I've obviously dated people in the past, great people, whether it was timing or just slight differences, um, my belief has always been like, if there's one thing you should be picky about in your life, it's that. And, um, you know, I had a friend tell me once, like, none of it's going to make sense until it all makes sense. And sometimes I feel like, uh, I just got to be, keep being me and things will, things will work out. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's definitely one of those things where 
if I knew the answer, I would solve for it. It's not like I'm hiding in the corners by any means. I just, uh, that's one that escapes me so far. And I, maybe, I don't know, maybe I need like a dating coach or something. I have no idea. <laughs> I feel like I'm pretty <laughs> outgoing. I, uh, I put myself out there, but it's just, it's just kind of finding the right match. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the world that feels that way. Oh but, no. Uh, Do you think you have the market space for a companion? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, here, I've thought about this a lot too. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Christian person. I'm, I have a sense of faith. And when I look at what I'm doing right now with Uncharted, it almost gives me goosebumps when I look at my whole life and how I learned all these different experiences, doing all these kind of very separate things. But now I'm using every single one of them to build this company. And part of that too is I've, I've had some success in the past and I had enough, enough resources to, to launch something like this. Like ordering the first 1,000 units, I, I had to sell a townhome and use that, all that money to buy inventory. Now, if I had a family with two kids, I probably would have never taken that risk, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm like, geez, I gotta, I take care of my family. I'll just take another job or I'll do this slower or whatever. But I, I was able to kind of burn the bridges and go all in because it was just, it was just me. Sometimes deep down, I'm like, I'm just on this journey. And sometimes I can see parts of it. And for me, it's just a matter of kind of trusting that journey. And I feel like maybe we get this up and rolling and I can someday pay myself the first dollar. And then maybe it's time to start thinking about bringing somebody else in that I can also take care of in some way. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's definitely a, a very busy, chaotic time. And I think sometimes when we're so focused on growing our business or X, Y, Z, that's taking a lot of space and energy. We may not be as, our blinders might be on a little bit, you know, so those opportunities in the grocery store where, which I don't know if you go to the grocery store, but let's say you do, um, you might order your groceries online. Maybe you should start. Uh, but, (laughs) but maybe there's, there are a couple things that have happened where you just haven't realized because you weren't in that space. So we have just been open. You've, you've been an entrepreneur and you've had hyper busy times in your life. Was there a time when that changed for you or when oh was your Oh my moment? gosh. I was, yeah, I did not balance well with relationships at the height of my kind of entrepreneurial peak and journey. Um, it was very tough. It was, right. it was. And, and, and so I can totally relate and, but, but in some ways I think it's a mindset too of, in in my case, I was in a relationship, and so that's it wasn't necessarily open to a new one. But Got it. yeah, I think that whole space market space <laughs> <laughs> like that one. could be uh, could be. But it's yeah, it's just thinking about it and being open to it. I have a friend who she didn't date for a long time, got out of a relationship that was pretty rocky, and didn't want to, and then decided, okay, I actually want to now, but she didn't really know how to get started. So she did the whole online thing. This was before Tinder and before the apps and stuff. Um, and she immediately met someone in person because she just had that shift in, in energy. Right. So you hear those things, but, um, all right. So I'll keep an eye out for you. Christian, if you're listening, Christian's photo is on my Instagram and I'm promoting this show. No, just kidding. <laughs> well, give it a few more weeks because like literally last night I went to bed at 1 a.m. I think I woke up at 2.30 and answered emails for two hours. And then I got up at 6 for a, a conference call. I mean, maybe next month is the right month to start. But uh, So you're saying you're unavailable after no, all that? No, I don't want to say that. I'm just saying, talking about market space, I'm... I'm you're at I've capacity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is obviously a, a rare situation with the exposure and everything going on. But um, yeah, I'm I'm joking mostly. I'm, it'd be nice to have some conversations at least start down that path. Me too. I'm mostly joking too. So, um, <laughs> so- outside of that, though, you know, <laughs> we're talking about relationships. But I just moved to Park City. Um, you know, I I grew up in a small town where my parents were just super involved with the community. Um, to help build the hockey rink in town and are on all these different boards. And that was always something I just uh, respected, admired so much. And living in LA and Orange County and kind of being a transplant, it just seemed it wasn't the right time or the right place. I, I think I always knew deep down I didn't want to put roots down. But I moved to Park City in March. I want to stay here. And I think I think one of the things I'm towing the water a little bit on, I want to start doing more and more, is just 
becoming a bigger part of this community, whether that means running for mayor someday or just simply taking part in more 5Ks and, you know, pancake eating fundraisers. Mm -hmm. um, that's something, believe it or not, is hard for me because usually I'm so laser focused on everything I'm doing and time's so short, it's hard to actually just stop and go out and try to interject into the community and kind of start being a part of it. So... That's super cool, though. Yeah, just the fact that you have intentions of of doing that, you could easily say, that's just one box I don't have time to check right now. But it's, and I think that actually can help the other <laughs> a lot, right? But As I was saying that, I was like, oh, these are like the same. <laughs> here we go, here we go. No. Uh, so that's, that's really admirable. And I, I think that that's... Um, it just shows a lot about your character as well and wanting to integrate with the community and and that's very cool. A uh, couple rapid fire questions to to wrap this up. Pirates or ninjas? Who is tougher? Oh man, I didn't even think about this but I knew you asked this one. Um, man, I think I like ninjas. First of all, pirates have a tendency to look kind of dirty and grimy and I well, I like being outside. I also enjoy a good shower. But I think I think ninjas are precision and they are focused and they get in and they get out and they don't make too big of a mess. They just get the job done. And I, I think mm -hmm. to me that's a lot cooler. So ladies, Christian likes cleanliness. <laughs> no, just kidding. I just shower, that's not the problem. <laughs> um so okay, so pirates need your uncharted supply kit probably. Or your uncharted supply kit products i would say more so is what you're telling me is ninjas ninjas aren't your target audience okay cool <laughs> and with the final question here what would you tell your younger self oh wow um you know oddly enough growing up like i i don't i don't talk to anybody i went to high school with and from a small coming from a small town that's probably pretty odd i had a i had a rough upbringing i was pretty overweight um I, w I don't want to say I got bullied, but I definitely got left out of a lot of stuff. And I think those were really, those were, those are formidable years and they were also really hard years. And I think going through that, man, I hate to use the term, put a chip on my shoulder, but I do believe that things happen for a reason later, later down the road. And I think life teaches you the lessons you need, and whether that's me being more compassionate to people that I maybe otherwise wouldn't be, or giving me just that, that little extra bit of drive to, you know, succeed or to push through something that maybe otherwise I would have given up on. Um, I'm thankful for all those things that happened. So I would probably, t <laughs> I would probably tell myself like, these are all just lessons and embrace them and make the most of them because they'll come in handy later. That's great. Good advice. Great advice. And I, I loved our conversation. This has been fun. Thank you, you for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I look, I looked at the list of people you've had and I'm like, holy smokes. I hope I can at least make this interesting for people because you've had some pretty amazing people on here and I've really loved, I've loved listening since the, the first episode. So it's an honor. You're all rock stars. I mean, I only target fascinating people. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and, and congrats on the success. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. My conversation with Christian around the concept of zone of genius versus zone of excellence is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. I asked my friend Susie Batiste, a former Why Not Now podcast guest and the founder of Poopery, to join me and discuss that very topic because she's the one who introduced me to the concept to begin with. Susie has one of the most colorful journeys I've ever come across. From experiencing bankruptcies and marital abuse to growing a business empire that's now valued at more than $300 million. I've learned so much from Susie so I want to share her brilliance with you. Welcome back to the show, Susie. How are you doing today? Mm, amazing. Good, good. Well, I am really excited to talk through this concept that you introduced to me, and then I ended up reading the book about it, but this concept of zone of genius versus zone of excellence. 
ever since you've mentioned this to me, and then I researched a little bit more, it keeps kind of coming up in conversation as it did with Christian, who changed lanes so many times in his career. Can you start by sharing a little bit about the difference in the two and and how you came about kind of discovering your own zone of excellence and zone of genius? Yeah, I feel really excited about this conversation. I'm sort of bouncing up and down on my swapper right now. Uh, <laughs> this, this conversation just turns me on. Um, yeah, so I found out about Zone of Excellence and Zone of Genius from Gay Hendricks. Um, and he wrote the book, The Big Leap. I think you're going to interview him in a bit. But he, yes. um, when I first read that, I was amazed. The way he describes it is your zone of excellence is something that you're really, really, you're excellent at. And what's wild and what's catchy about the zone of excellence is the world rewards you for that. So I used to think being an entrepreneur was my zone of genius, right? I thought I'm a genius entrepreneur. That's what I've done since I was, you know, 19 years old. And um, what I've come to find out over, gosh, probably three or four years inquiring and what is my zone of genius, I kind of landed on something recently and, um, I'm really excited to to talk about it. And it's usually your zone of genius is something Gay says um, that it's something that you used to do when I think he says about like four years old. And I used to think back, like, what did I do when I was four years old? And I just now landed on this. This has been a a pretty in-depth, you know, kind of inquiry for me. And what happened, Amy Jo, is I have this picture that my dad took when I was about four. And I don't know if you've seen it. It's the black and white picture where I'm holding the sparkler. Have you seen that? I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah, it's such a great picture. I'll send it to you. But I'm, um, it's at night, and I'm showing my sister a sparkler, and I am so excited. And my sister is two years younger than me in the photo, and she has her eyes shut, and she's grabbed onto my arm. And I'm literally, like, just in, you know, so excited about the magic that's in that sparkler. Even though she's scared, I I have this look on my face, like, don't worry about it. Like, let me show you kind of the way, you know, that let me show you the sparkler. And uh, just this past week, which I love how timely you are, I, I've been really looking at that picture and focusing on it. And what I've realized is that my zone of genius is actually believing in magic or transformation and then wanting to share that with the world. That's it. So uh, poopery is just one of those, right? It's like what I did is I transformed the smell of poop and now I share it with the world. I, I go through these processes of you know that, a personal development. And then I want to just share them. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, usually when we talk, I'm like, you're not going to believe the latest insight I just had. And that actually is my zone of genius. Wow. I, yeah, it sure is. I mean, that makes total sense. And and you show people the way you light, you light up the unknown too. It's, ooh, that's good. It's so much bigger than nailing down you know one thing that's a little bit more tangible like being an entrepreneur and I think that that's where if when I think about my zone of genius versus excellence my excellence is more ta- it's a little more tangible it's it's a little easier to describe because it's it's just tactical um, but go back to childhood and if you're trying to help someone talk through, how to identify their zone of genius. What would be the first step you would suggest? I would say go back and try to find pictures. Or if you don't, I didn't remember a lot of my childhood, um, as you know, because I grew up in kind of a a dysfunctional um, family. So as I was going back, so what I would do is I would tell you to go back and look through pictures when you're three and four and just start asking if your parents are still alive or if there are people that knew you when you were that age, what did I like doing? And you'll probably hear from Gay. He used to, you know, he's a PhD um, psychologist. And what he would do is he would set up this um, booth in his house, and he would interview all of his family, right? <laughs> like, it was wow. like bring, 
bring your problems here when he was like four or five years old. So of course, that's what he's going to do in life. That's what he does. You know, wow. he's, he's a psychologist. Um, so it, what he says is that'll give you a hint of what your zone of genius is when you go back to like four to four to six years old. And what did you love doing? And what did you do naturally? Not that your friends and family coerced you or had you doing, what did you do in your free time? Because that's going to tell you, kind of give you a hint. And I had that hint. I thought, oh, I used to make things and I used to make Barbie clothes, which I did. But what I've landed on lately is so much bigger than that. Yeah, absolutely. Would you consider your zone of genius to be related, like uh, siblings, with your why? Why you do what you do, your, your purpose? I mean, is are the two interrelated? Absolutely. Yeah, I would think I so too. I felt excitement <laughs> in my body when you said that. I was like, yes, that's exactly what it is. Because so, what else has made sense um, is that. When I look back at my life, think about the four-year-old that believed in trans- that believed in magic and transformation and change, and that there was something better. But when you look at my life, you know the the bankruptcies, the suicide attempts, the you know my whole story that's pretty dramatic. And then look at how I've transformed it all. Is how else could my life have been lived? Right. Like I was literally living out that belief of the four-year-old. Well, and I imagine we suppress at times. Because, you know, stemming back from your early childhood, it's so suppressed. It probably takes a lot of uncovering and and removing layers to identify your zone of genius. Do you, is it sometimes easier for other people that are close to you to identify your zone of genius before you do or help you with it? I'm, I'm not sure of that. I think you can, I think it's, you know, my sense is, my experience is that it had to come from within me. Mm -hmm. I could interview and ask people what I used to do. Um, But when I really, it's really something that came from inside of me. And it's been, like I said, it's been quite a process of inquiry. I thought my zone of genius is something I could land on really quickly. And like, oh, this is going to be it. And I remember um, people in the Hendrix program had told me like, oh, it, it, it could take a while. I was like, really? Like, why can't I just discover this fast? And it's literally, like you said, it's been an unpeeling and like, okay, well, it's not quite that. And like I said, the tricky part is Gay says to, I think he lives 100% of his life in his zone of genius. And he says at first, just try to live, you know, 10% of your life in your zone of genius and then 20 and then 30 and keep rearranging your life so that all you do is live in your zone of genius. But where I found that can get tricky is the world rewards you in your zone of excellence. That's where you win awards and, you know, Mm -hmm. you get all the kudos and make the big salaries. (laughs) It's not necessarily for your zone of genius because you haven't quite landed on that yet. You don't know how to share that with the world. Makes total sense. And I, I think sometimes just because we're good at something doesn't mean it makes us happy too. Um, And sometimes we are happy in our zone of excellence and, and that's great. Uh, But the joy that you can achieve at the zone of genius level is probably 10 times. That's it. And what Gay says is it's often hidden because it's so subtle. It's like breathing. Like you're not even aware you do it. Like it seems it's so natural and so easy that you're, you know, the rational mind thinks, how could I possibly get paid for that? Right. Mm -hmm. So 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 you you go towards your zone of excellence because there's work involved and there's payoff because your zone of genius is just that's the way you are. Like and it's so inherent in you. You don't even have to try. There's zero effort. It's just literally what you do. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. 
A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now?